All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish Entering the Kingdom of the Cults. My name is Jeremiah Roberts. I'm one of the co-hosts here. We are joined here by Jack Marino Chen. It's good to have you back. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to let you ask the first question. You probably, you were listening a lot, sleuthing around the background. I'm going to let you ask the first question with everything that she told. I mean, we la- at the last part, she pretty much walked through. It was the cuts, is the Assassin's Creed cut scene, right? Minus the, whatever those little things are attached to the uh, forearm. I've Psh- never seen it. So. No, you know, you know what I'm talking about if you're a gamer. Uh, but yeah, anyways. Andrew, what are you, what's on your mind with everything with uh, Jack's uh, testimony, where she's at right now in her, in her story? Yeah, so coming into these uh, various rites and, rites and rituals that you were doing now in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, what, what did you think about truth, right, and the progression mm-hmm. of your life from being a young uh, child to seeing these three light beings to then, you know, getting into a relationship with a guy who's kind of like your guru for a while and now being at the hermetic order of the golden dawn did you think that truth was progressing that you're mm. getting somewhere that you had truth back then but now there's more light in this darkness where where exactly were you at that's a good question i definitely thought that truth was evolving i thought that i had my whole life been ignorant and not awakened to that yet that i was being held back by dogma 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 I heard that so much heard that recently. Um, I know that that's, it's just widely taught in the occult, but believing that that was holding me back, my, whatever I thought faith was, whatever, whoever I thought Jesus was, was this watered down version meant to control me. And what I was learning now was the truth. And it's interesting how there's no dogma yet. There is this truth and we're going to teach it to you and you have to do these rites and rituals. So it amazes me how looking back, I, n- now being truly saved, having God's word, it's the firm foundation I can stand on. But back then, these things kind of attack each other. But I didn't see that at the time. I just thought once I learn more, it'll all come together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm looking back as well, real quick, um, you know, with having retrospection in a sense. Um, why is it not surprising to you that this uh, Scottish Rite of Freemasonry uh, Lodge referred mm. you to the East Order of the Eastern Star, which then refers you to uh, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn or someone in your relationships and uh, your families did? Uh, wh- why is that no surprise? Is there a similarity between the three? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was founded by three Master Masons and it is really tied to Rosicrucianism, which is tied to Freemasonry. So it's kind of, there's Freemasonry, there's Rosicrucianism, there's the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is more practical magic. So it takes the philosophies that are taught in Rosicrucianism, and I can't speak for Freemasons, but it seems the same thing, especially since we were using their ritual rooms, the symbology was the, the symbolism was the same, those kind of things. Mm-hmm. But it they all tie together and um, they all have this secret knowledge. And so, yeah, it looking back, it amazes me. It, it amazes me, but I'm not surprised that they all were coming together. At that time, I didn't understand the connection. It was kind of just one thing after another leading to another. But now... For, uh, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn being the practical application of the philosophies taught in these more philosophical order orders. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a complex world. In fact, I, I just talked with someone, I think next year, we're going to actually have someone who's a former like Rosicrucian. Mm. And it's just so interesting because it's almost, <laughs> it's almost kind of like you have this like multiverse of p- different practices of different people, um, you know, across, I don't know, maybe I'm thinking my brain's like going into Marvel mode or whatever, but you you do see it. But at the end of the day, like all of them, it, it all comes down to one similarity. It's all secret, private, hidden, esoteric knowledge, understanding by way. And it's always a little bit different. Like I said, there's some differences between, Andrew, you mentioned Gnosticism, Hermeticism. But at the end of the day, it's a distinction between the material, the immaterial. It's a distortion of the incarnation of Jesus Christ who's fully God and fully man. Right. But again, you have Christ in whom all the treasures, wisdom, and knowledge are hidden versus all this hidden stuff. Mm-hmm. So 
speaking of hidden stuff, you are uh, in a sort of like this hidden place. This is these. This takes place not out in the open. Like this takes place in these areas, and it was so it was a lodge that was facilitating where you do these rites and practices. Yes, I I didn't know how they were booking it or anything like that, yeah. but every time we met, which was once a month or the conclave that I went to, which was from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., three days, you're there all day. And we had the whole lodge and the rituals are always practiced in the Freemason ritual room. Hey, what's up, everyone? We love that you are enjoying our content on a weekly basis, but this program cannot continue and wouldn't be possible without your support. So if you want to go to thecultistshow.com, there is a donate tab. You can either support us one time or you can become a monthly partner with us that will allow us to continue this program, allow us to continue to be salt and light to the kingdom of the cults. So please go to thecultistshow.com forward slash donate and you can support us one time or monthly. Also, make sure you check out our merchandise store. Go to shopcultish.com. You can see all of our great designs. A lot of you have, have gotten merchandise from us already. So again, you either go to shopcultish.com and check out all the awesome merch. Back to the show. And then just, uh, wow, Wait, Andrew, what do, you, do you have a question or what? what's on your mind? You're just So you're doing like some occultic practices for eight hours a day for three days of the week. Um, what? types i'm not asking for what the rituals uh entailed or anything like that but was there ever contact with uh demonic entities during these rituals yes um but again i wouldn't have thought they were demonic at that time and so it's a little bit blurry on when exactly i started to be afraid enough to realize i need christ i need i need someone because this isn't this is scary um but a lot of that, a lot of what started that is uh, during while I'm in the order, starting to have these more experiences with alien entities, thinking that thinking that it's a good thing, thinking that these entities, again, love me, that I'm special to them. They want to see through my eyes, all these things. But as I'm in the order, as I'm practicing these things, we're given like the banner of the West, for example, is a symbol that you visualize and it is used as protection or um, the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. You use that all the time before a ritual work to mm-hmm. banish, um, to make sure you're you're safe, basically. There are all these things. So it's it was recognized that these kind of attacks could happen. It was more defined as like this psychic negativity or something. But I was definitely experiencing that. And for me, that happened with also wanting it to happen. This is kind of going off topic of what you asked. But I both wanted to have these experiences because I believed that was my next thing. And I was terrified. So it was this weird thing. But Mm -hmm. started having these experiences with the same alien entities that I'd been seeing throughout my life. Only they were getting more real and those memories were more real to me than my waking life. Also doing astral projection, lucid dreaming, and just having experiences that were really molding my reality. So all that's happening while I'm in this order. And uh, it was just very confusing and scary. But mm-hmm. um, is that? do you think that's helpful for me to talk about going to detail on or yeah i think well i think it is in the sense because again we want to let people know that you know a lot of times you might have friends that are talking about this experience Mm -hmm. that's like real and tangible and it's very easy especially just because a lot of times we view stuff that's going on the supernatural through the lens of somebody on tbn or somebody blowing the wind of god if you know Mm -hmm. what i mean like somebody some charlatan on television or just a sensationalism of the supernatural. Like, but what you're dealing with is like tangibly real. So I think there's a danger between sometimes, you know, people looking at something like that and just thinking, oh, well, this is just all in your head. You know, I, I think that's important to realize that like you're dealing with something tangibly real. So I think if we approach it through that level, I think it's very, uh, very important and appropriate. Okay. And I do think that just, Again, to preface, it it wasn't just one day I had this experience and that's why it wasn't weird. It was since a child, I believe, that these entities yeah. 
cared for me. So wanting to have these experiences, kept having moments where I'd be dreaming and then I'd wake up from my dream to a different dream that's, that felt very real where these entities would want me to, to interact with them, but they just felt so powerful, like a presence that I was, I was too terrified to ever uh, approach them. And that happened many times, me just really wanting to, to, I don't know, get to know them or do whatever they wanted me to do. But ultimately, I was very afraid of them. Now I don't believe they were aliens. I believe they were demons, fallen angels, masquerading as, really masquerading as angels of light because I thought that they were good. But um, I had an experience where, again, I was... I was uh, going to sleep or and then I was dreaming and then I woke up from my dream on an operating table in um, a UFO and I just remember it so clearly and it was just really disturbing um, and these were this was a different looking alien entity than the ones I'd seen before but again it wasn't like this dream it haunted me because I knew it sounded crazy and yet it was more real to me than anything that I'd experienced and took something out of me, which like physically hurt. And then I woke up in a, in like extreme physical pain, had to go to urgent care, had to get, um, an ultrasound on my ovaries. And it was this whole thing that was, I, I was, (laughs) it's embarrassing to talk about. And I felt so crazy. Like I couldn't talk to anyone about it. It was extremely isolating. Well, isn't this indicative of the fact of, you know, you, you, there's always these stories of people who have these, you know, alien abductions where it's literally, this is a similar experience where it's, it's they're on some sort of operating table being experimented on by some aliens and entities. Um, and, but also like a lot of times, this is a total side note, even people who aren't Christians, they have this experience. And this is, if you just look up the whole history of these type of encounters is that when people a lot of times they do call, and I don't know if this is where you were at, but a lot of times people do call to the name of Jesus mm. and the oppression, the encounters, these experiments, and they, they stop. Mm-hmm. So there is there is something that's like real and tangible there for sure. But that's right. that was what was going on there. Yeah, and I'm glad that you brought that up because it was this, that was the first experience that like I realized maybe they don't love me, which was, it sounds, again, it just sounds like words, but for me that was shaking because since I was a child I believe these entities love me and that was the first time that it was like oh maybe maybe this isn't good yeah and so but I'm glad that you mentioned that about calling on the name of Jesus because that was a big turn where I thought okay this is I don't have a lot of control here and I need to call on Jesus and so I started using Jesus as more of a magic word I didn't know the gospel and I just wanted the power. I wanted to keep actively pursuing experiences with these entities while calling on Jesus for protection. Just in case it gets you out of control. Right. And now having read Acts 19, where it talks about, where it talks about a demon overpowering, um, I, I can't quote the exact story, but the demon overpowering someone who's using the name of Jesus and he, the demon says something like, uh, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but you I don't know or something yeah. like that. And that just really hit me because, again, using this as a magic word and yet not submitting to the authority of Christ, not recognizing him as Lord, not wanting to turn from my sin, but thinking it's okay for me to use him, like use him. Um, and that was something that happened a lot in the order using Jesus, using yeah. the w- names of God. And I, just to clarify, and Andrew, I'll let you jump in here. How old were you when this these encounters happened where it was these... Uh, abductions if you, and a, this abduction happened uh in how like do you early remember? 20s early 20s so you're looking at probably like a decade and a half from the very first time you saw lights in the sky as a child mm-hmm. i mean it's such, i just thought it's such an interesting timeline between that time there what seems like very nice and innocent and that's the, like the thing that's always creepy the thing about movies it's like whenever there's anything that where it's like it makes a child evil or a child's being messed with it bothers all of us intangibly because we know there's like that innocence that mm-hmm. suffering out the children suffering out the little children aesthetic and but now it's like all these years later it's like yeah it's like the entities turn on you like a decade and a half later right 
Yeah. yeah. And but I wasn't even I can I twisted in my mind that maybe it was a good thing that like I should yeah. want to be used by them if they want to use me like that's okay and so kept having experiences but the worst one was when I I again woke up from a dream and I was in my apartment and it was the same they always look like tall gray aliens but wanted me to look this entity in the eye that entity wanted me to look it in the eye and I was afraid and when I finally did I felt like my soul was going to come out of my body and it was just like the I woke up and said it was like a very like the darkest mirror like it was just pure darkness and and all the darkness in me and it was and I think that was a big turning point where I I knew that they were demons but at that point being in the order being so twisted I thought maybe Lucifer is the good guy so at that point even though things are being revealed to me I was so deep in thinking that maybe maybe the story is 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 inverted maybe the the dark what we perceive as darkness is actually good maybe mm-hmm. lucifer's the good guy again it just amazes me that if i had known who christ is that he truly came and died in our place that he bore our sins on the cross bore the wrath of god and died on the cross, raised on the third day, and is now seated at the right hand of God as the one mediator between God and man, that I could have had my sins forgiven. I could have been made a new creation. I could have had peace. He says, come Mm -hmm. to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That was me. That was me from day one. I could have gone to the true good shepherd who is fully worthy of my whole life, but instead I didn't know the truth and I loved my sin. And so I continued in rebellion mm. throughout my life. And and even at that point where I was faced with, okay, this isn't working, I still loved my sin. I, I loved mm-hmm. it and I didn't want to turn. So trying to justify in any way, maybe this is the good thing. Wow. Andrew, um, what, what's on your mind? What do you think of man? Yeah, so looking back uh, at your life now, um, thinking about the various rites and rituals that are performed in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, uh, does it, it seems to be that those give the illusion of control over some form of spiritual realm or entities in which you can get information from to help uh, bolster your spiritual awareness in a weird sense. But is that the truth, right? Like it seems like you're bringing to, the, to light and you're showing us that all of those rites and rituals, those are illusions of control and you're actually being manipulated by Mm. evil forces that are literally can care less about a ritual. Like a ritual has no power in and of itself. Um, but you're just allowing these things into your life and giving them the ability to manipulate and control you. Is that kind of how it is? Absolutely. And I think it was hard for me to, to really (laughs) accept that as, but even coming out of that relationship. I refused to believe that I was manipulated or anything like that. So it just felt like this too. It was really hard for me to see this as bad, but I also wanted to find a back door to God. That was the way that I worded it a lot of the time. I wanted my own way to God where I didn't have to turn from sin, where I didn't have to submit to this God, where I could write the the rules in that sense. So just trying to come at it, trying these rituals were alluring because I did I could I could have God my own way. I could have Jesus my own way. And the Jesus of the Golden Dawn does not require you to turn from sin, does mm-hmm. not require you to submit to him as Lord. But instead you become Christ. Christ is a type that you are to become. You are ultimately your own savior. I mean verbatim in the yeah. in the in the literature that I was given from them. Wow. Um, so you're at a point where, you know, we're talking about it being a spiritual narcotic, the continued progression. Um, and so you're at this like pinnacle where it's just like as black as black could be, as far as like spiritual darkness goes. Um, and you're using kind of Jesus as sort of like your, you know, you're like one fit in case things get too bad. Like what happened from there? So I I believe it was at that conclave where we were there for you know so long uh, for three days. But at one point I'm I'm wrestling with this. I'm I'm saying oh I'm I'm a Christian. I was really trying to hold on to Christ at at one point when it got scary enough while while still having him my own way. Mm-hmm. 
And so I'm there and practicing rituals. We did a lot of invocation rituals and like in, invoking these entities and um, a, a lot of uh, rituals. And and I think it's important to say for because it's so easy to demonize people in these things as, yeah. oh, they're they're drinking blood and they're wishing harm on on everyone. I wouldn't be surprised if there are people doing that, but that's most people that I've met, most people that I've gone and talked to that are still in this kind of thing, they think what they're doing is good and they're, they think they're helping themselves and helping people. And that's what I thought. But when it gets perverted enough that you believe Lucifer is good, then it gets really iffy. But practicing these rituals in the lodge and uh, some of them were Isis invocation, the the goddess Isis and yeah. uh, prophecy over us. Uh, the Thoth invocation was really feeding my ego as I was moving up um, to another grade. And oh, you, you moved up so fast! And Thoth really, you really have a connection with Thoth during the invocation. And to me, like I felt like I'm good at this. This is what I'm good at. And and even though I was, the Lord was starting to really open my eyes to the darkness of this, I didn't know who I was apart from that. I didn't know how to separate. If I were to really turn from sorcery, magic, astrology, alchemy, all these things, like I didn't think that there would be me. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I was too far gone. Yeah. And in the Golden Dawn, they practiced Kabbalah. And in a lot of the rituals, they quote scripture completely out of context, things like uh, the verse about like, uh, let me look it up, but something about wash me with hyssop. Uh, that would be a Psalm 51. Thank you. But, but that yeah. quoting that and out of context, a lot of stuff in Latin. Yeah. So it, it's like, Oh, the Bible's in this, but it's not almost like pre-reformation. You know, you think about that, like prior to Luther translating the Bible into German, like they had always kind of used only the priest could access in Latin. So it's almost like right. you're sort of vicariously experiencing that. Absolutely. And and something else that stood out to me was even in some of the grades, the the materials are are ciphered. So you have to know the secret language to even read the material, which makes it sound so much more exciting. And the cipher manuscripts, which are what the Golden Dawn came from, mm -hmm. it's it's in a script that had to be ciphered and and so it's all this adding it's almost like this secret language so you couldn't just read my materials because it wouldn't make sense to you but that's done on purpose because it's the allure of this secret knowledge you have to learn more to understand and you're not you're not special enough or that whole idea that yeah. the higher knowledge um so Doing these rituals, the Lord was so kind. At one point, we would take the Eucharist, but to Osiris, um, just blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy. Um, but convincing myself that this is Osiris is the true Christ. So, so that was almost like your way of like doing like a black mass or something like that. Similar. I don't know what a black mass is. Well, that's like the. It's basically. Uh, I believe, I think it's the Church of Satan where they just, it's like it's similar. It's like a communion, but it's like an unholy communion, mm. basically. Yeah, it was a uh, wine, bread, uh, going like this mm -hmm. uh, to Osiris. Um, it was just uh, blasphemy, but yeah. I thought it was powerful. And um, so, yeah, really deep into that. And, you know, I could go on, but it was, I just want to emphasize it was real. So mm -hmm. when I see this again in kids shows, things like that sorcery yeah. like i see that and i say that's real stuff that really happens in real secret places that is sending real people to hell yeah. and deceiving them and so it breaks my heart to see it joked about like as though it's a fun thing because it's real but yeah. when i was practicing the eucharist i believe that i had this vision that you know christ christ was in me and all this darkness was being heaped on me but it, it wasn't you know, crisis and everyone and whatever. So that kind of kept me in it because I believe that I was gaining these insights about Christ. So why should I leave actually Christ is in this? And that's another reason why I think visions and dreams and these kind of things, really putting experience above scripture. Because at this point I'd started reading scripture. I would just open it and it just happened to be that it would be talking about sorcery being an abomination. And I'm like, no, that can't be right. Yeah. And just... It would freak me out, and I, I, I felt that I was under God's wrath. 
and I felt the weight of all my sin throughout my life, and no other religion was getting rid of it. Hey everyone, if you are watching us right now on Apologia Studios YouTube channel, you need to know that Cultish would not be possible if it wasn't for this studio. So if you want to support Apologia Studios, which also makes Cultish a possibility for you to enjoy every single week here on YouTube, go to ApologiaStudios.com. You can become an all-access member, and you will also get a lot of great additional content, which will also help support the studio, which will allow Cultish to be a possibility as well on a weekly basis. So we thank you all for watching us, and now back to the episode. Uh, Andrew, you can give me your thoughts here. I just want to say it's interesting. So in other words, like your con- your process of like your spiritual evolution, if you want to call it that, is like you're trying to be continually like syncretistic, blending in everything. Right. All of a sudden the Bible gets thrown in and you're trying to be syncretistic, but as you are kind of going through it, it starts to be a sword. Yes. Convicting. Yes. Showing the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Absolutely. And that's not what you're going for. (laughs) No. And so I would just kind of hide it. I started sleeping with the Bible under my bed because I was scared, but um, every time I read it, I would be convicted of sin and felt that way. But, you know, same within the culture today. Shame is bad. You just have to think positive. It's not real. Sin is meant to oppress you. All these ideas, if I just think positively, then the shame will go away. If I just think this way, then this weight will go away. But it didn't, and it doesn't. And only Christ truly saves. And I was looking into Islam. I was I read the whole Bhagavad Gita as it is with the commentary. Didn't didn't save me, didn't relieve me of my sin. Searching anywhere yeah. for some kind of relief. Didn't want to go. I felt like it would be like go, slinking back to Christ. But God, in his kindness, used me reading those scriptures. First, I read... Um, the one that stuck stuck out to me that you can tell a tree by its fruit Mm -hmm. didn't really know what that meant but i knew that the fruit of the of the tree of the hermetic order of the golden dawn was bad fruit i knew that the highest up were just as depraved as me i could tell that i loved them in a in a worldly way i don't think i was capable of biblical love but they were they were broken and they were had addictions and they weren't free they weren't Mm -hmm. saved and that really was like as uh, Elisa Childers says, a pebble in my shoe, like it bothered me. Yeah. And then I read that Satan masquerades himself as an angel of light. And that one hit me because I was really truly believing Satan, Lucifer was the light bearer. Maybe him giving us the fruit was actually a good thing. Maybe he wanted us to have intelligence and knowledge and, and really perverting the truth, flipping the script. Mm. And I realized, okay, that's what he's doing. But I was still too prideful to turn. And then I read that, I, really, I just remembered Genesis 3, the f- the first lie that we have in the garden where Satan says, if you or the serpent says, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll become like God, knowing good and evil. And that was a whole thing that I was in, is you need to gain the knowledge of good and evil to become like God. And I knew in that moment without a shadow of a doubt that Satan is behind what I'm in. And you'd think that I would say, okay, that's, that makes sense. I'm going to get out. But I didn't, I thought I'm too far gone. My addictions are too strong. I don't know who I'd be. And so I kept going in it. And, but God, Mm -hmm. (laughs) one night I was walking across my apartment. I had my tarot cards out. It was just any other night. And I was spiritually attacked and I fell to my knees. I couldn't even stand. And it felt like my soul was being sucked out into just complete darkness. And I had zero control over it. And I heard myself cry out, Jesus Christ, save me. Mm-hmm. And that amazed me that that's what I said. But I truly meant it. It was a desperate cry. And in that moment, like just like that, I... It, I knew it was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who had saved me, delivered me from that deep oppression or whatever was happening, attack. And I knew that I had the peace that I'd been looking for my whole life, because ultimately that's what I was looking for, peace and all these things. Mm -hmm. But nothing ever satisfied. But I had true peace. And I also knew for a fact that all the things that I'd been practicing and convincing myself were actually not that bad, were sin against this 
holy God, and that all in that dark checkerboard floored room, all that power was nothing, literally nothing compared to the power of God. It was nothing for him to save me. And I was shaking like crazy because it was a lot. And so I grabbed my Bible from under my bed and started reading it. And at first I still had that belief that I have this higher knowledge of mm-hmm. how to read the Bible. Gematria and Kabbalah takes the Bible yeah. and twists it, but it didn't matter what I thought because now the Holy, I had the Holy Spirit and I just recognized what I was reading as truth and it was feeding me. I felt like a broken cistern as the Bible talks about before where everything I took in, like I was still just empty. It was just pouring out. Yeah. And now I was being filled. I was being satisfied by God's living and active word, as you were saying, that judged the thoughts and intentions of my heart. And I was just reading it. I was hungry. Again, like I said, I was I was into this stuff. So now it was like, wow. I, I When I was in the occult, it was like that verse that says, um, talks about always learning and never coming to knowledge of the truth. Like it really was this just feedback loop. And then when I finally really read the Bible, it, it, it just satisfied me. And so by the time I finished reading it for the first time in my life since being 15, I knew I could get sober. And that was a huge deal to me because I was so struggling with addiction throughout my life that just knowing that I have the Lord now, because there were so many other things I tried that were just vanity, mm-hmm. just superficial, but I had changed on the inside. Like me, yeah had become something else. And that just amazed me. The difference between the secret knowledge that is false and the true living word of God and the true Christ that actually saves. Hmm. It's it's amazing. Andrew, wow. what, what, what year was this? This was, I believe, at the end of 2016 or early 2017. Wow. And, and so this, this salvation came to you in a, in a split second, the realization of previously reading God's word and having those convictions through God's word. All of a sudden you're going through the spiritual attack and then you call out to Jesus. And then all of a sudden those convictions come to full fruit because you have regeneration and God placing his spirit within you. Like this happened instantaneously is what you're saying. Yes. And it's cool how before that God had been planting seeds. Like I was driving from San Diego to LA and something came on the radio. I didn't realize it was a pastor else. I would have probably turned it off, but I was like, what is this? This is what I've been, this is the truth. And then I found out it was a pastor and was so confused, but the Lord had been planting these seeds. But in that moment, I didn't do any work. There's nothing. I didn't clean myself up. I didn't do anything. The Lord saved me in that moment when I called on the name of Christ, truly. Mm -hmm. What happened after that? I mean, I know a lot of times you'll hear stories of people who get saved out of the new age. And it's like, because it's funny too, because a lot of times people who are in the new age, they talk about Christianity as somehow some sort of conspiratorial um, order to try and control people to not get into this esoteric things. But in reality, a lot of times when new agers get saved, there's this immediate conviction. Like I have to get rid of all of my stuff. Mm. Like I have to burn it, destroy it. I can't like, I I can't sell. I can't do nothing. I have to get rid of it. Was that something like that for you or how did those convictions, what was it like? Cause you were saved in the middle of all that. Then it's kind of like, what do I do here? Mm. Like, what was that process like for you? Well, I'd say even to what you're saying, how that's so true that it convinces you. Christianity is just trying to control you that it's the opposite the occult and the new age and these lies that you can get ultimately it's just works-based salvation yeah it all that's everything except for christianity is and it is bondage and in christ is true freedom and that's amazing but yeah for me and i'm and it's so true that for some people just like that and never drink again or never smoke again or uh, the lord can totally do that but for me that happened and the Lord began to truly sanctify me. And so it was me being in the word. I was still going to the Freemason Lodge practicing magic, but now I I was so convicted and it bothered me. And I would read more of God's word. I started in Genesis, went all the way through. So it took me time. I, I remember I was trying to practice astrology and I kept being convicted and I, it, 
I just this morning was looking through my old emails from the order and had emailed them saying, can a mentor talk to me? I'm, I'm struggling. I think that my Christian dogma is holding me back. This was right before I got saved. But the Lord was already doing this work in my heart and the encouragement that, no, you need to get out of that dogma. You're being like all these things were so ingrained in me thinking that I had this higher knowledge of the true Christ. And that's that really confused me. But it didn't matter again because mm-hmm. the Lord was doing a work in me. And so but it was truly by the time or at least right when I almost finished the Bible that I finally knew I could get sober. And then I started going to a church near me in Hollywood that was really wonderful. And um, the pastor slowly went through the word with me, the things that I just thought I knew better. He was patient, him and his Mm -hmm. wife. And I got to the point when I really realized I can't, I can't be in this order. I just really tried to convince myself, but the Lord did that work in me that I knew I really, I can't practice these things. I tried to do astrology every day. Mm -hmm. And I was just so convicted that I stopped before the month mark. I was trying to just get through a month to prove to myself it wasn't bad. And so I reached out to them um, saying, I can't, I'm, I'm leaving, but they say you can't leave. You can only, I think it's called stepping away or something. But I was like, okay, well, I'm leaving. And so I just never went back. And they've reached out a few times, nothing violent or anything like that but just to finish the great work and and all that but yeah so yeah uh and then i got baptized and ever since just and there were times when i i thought oh i'm gonna keep my book of shadows my ritual work journal you know for one day to to share what god's done in my life but i was just convicted i have such a bent towards that if i'm honest that that was my my most beloved sin and so it's unwise for me even in preparing for this Mm -hmm. i was convicted looking back at my old material i don't really need to do that as much as i think i do because because there can come a point for me that it's even learning about it isn't healthy for me right so coming to that conviction. But it just amazed me how the Lord was doing a work in me to convict me, to sanctify me. And yeah, it it was all him. And I think that really stood out to me how I didn't do, I used to do hours of rituals a day and all these things got me nowhere, but just submitting myself to Christ, believing in him truly and, and being in his word because I want to hear from him, praying to him and speaking to him. He speaks to me through his word. Mm-hmm. Like he did all the work and yeah. there's such a rest in that. Mm. Andrew, what are your thoughts? It's, it's absolutely amazing. I just praise God for it. Like first and foremost, all glory be to God for Amen. saving your soul. And it's, and it's not surprising to me, you know, in terms of you, you, you keep bringing uh, 2 Corinthians 11 into the equation where it says uh, Satan and his minions masquerade as angels of light. But what's funny is before that, in the section of scripture, it says uh, Paul is warning people about people who come and preach a different Jesus, a different gospel, who also accept a different spirit. So what we find within what was going on with you, when you're looking at the Bible, you weren't reading it for what it said, said actually. Instead, you were reading it in code, meaning mm-hmm. that you can't trust the word that's in front of you, right? Which leads you to a different Jesus, a different type of gospel, this works-based salvation. But if we look at it, uh, Mormonism does a very similar thing as well, right? They can't just sit there and read the word because it's missing many plain and precious parts. The devil works uh, so intricately in, the, in, in these ways where it's don't trust God's word. There's more to it. And this can be your salvation. This can be your progression. But you, but you uh, notated very amazingly is that only through Jesus do we have the ability to be free from the weight of even our past, mm. right? Because like you in your life, and I think a lot of people who have experienced physical, spiritual trauma, uh, abuse as a, ch- as a child, they fall into a lot of new age practices to have some form of control over their future, but they can never get rid of their past because what's going on really is Since you cannot get rid of the past, the past is actually being used to dictate your future. Whereas the Bible says is that God has declared the end from the beginning. He can tell you the future, but he can also tell you the past and exactly why it happened. So we have that resting God in the future to know what happened to us for what reason, what man intends for good God uses or what man intends for evil. God uses for good to bring about his purposes Right. And only through salvation, we have the ability to have peace with the things that happened to us in our past 
And we also understand that we cannot control the future, but we allow God Mm -hmm. to work in us. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing that you're highlighting that I think a lot of people in our society, our society today are looking for, they're looking for Jesus. Like you said, there's people that are doing these uh, rituals in the hermetic order of the golden dawn where they're not necessarily uh, sacrificing babies, right. Or drinking blood and doing this and that there are people that are looking for something that cannot be satisfied that only Jesus can fill because he's more powerful than all of these things. Our salvation is the most beautiful thing. Like you brought it back to the garden. There's a fundamental, uh, issue that we have and that sin, it separates us from God. And that sin also makes us think that we can become gods one day or somehow that that gap can be bridged through rites and rituals. But the reality is, is that the only person to bridge the gap between God and man is Jesus Christ, God himself, who died on the cross for our sins so that we could have peace with God and to truly love our neighbor, you know, to actually extend that love outward into society by being Uh, a good neighbor. Like it sounds like to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but within the hermetic order of the golden dawn, where's the love for neighbor, right? Like you couldn't even uh, interact with outside society, right? The God of the universe so floods into us that then we project that love into the world by spreading the gospel. But it, it sounds like the God of the hermetic order of the golden dawn is so internal that you're just lost in confusion. Mm. Is that something that you, that you'd see happening? Yeah, I think it comes down and praise God, everything you said, praise God that that's true. Um, Yeah, I think it comes down to believing you have this higher knowledge. And even in society, when ultimately, no, it's not truly loving your neighbor. There is the idea of, oh, yeah, loving the neighbor in in like social justice, that kind of thing. And it was that similar kind of love your neighbor by doing these things, but is that really loving them? Um, There's no evangelism. It's universalism. So uh, you could, you have to believe in a higher power. It can be any higher power. I believed I, I drew something where it's like, here's, here's a picture of God and here's lines drawing to every other religion. And it's all taking a bit of everything. And I thought it was this profound thing. But again, that doesn't save. It's an attack, too, on the sufficiency of Scripture. And when I was really thinking about Freemasonry, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, Rosicrucianism, ultimately, it's an attack on the sufficiency of Scripture. And I praise God that his word is true, not encoded, not this mystical meaning you have to read between the words. That does not save. It is not true. But just reading God's word, I love when Jesus talks about coming to him as a child and that he's hidden these things from the wise and the understanding. That's amazing. Our God is so good and so kind and we can trust his word as it's written and it is true. Um, And that's amazing. So Mm -hmm. yes, praise God to everything you said, but no, in the order, there is no true love. There's no true love of neighbor. Mm -hmm. It's a perverted view of the same ideas. And that also stood out to me that there's so many of the same concepts. We used Adonai, um, Elohim, all these words in rituals. So, oh, it's Christian because it uses these words. Just because it uses the same words doesn't mean it's Christian. We have to define the words. We have to see what what they mean for sure. There's always a language barrier to scale. One thing I appreciated that you shared just a moment ago was the, uh, really that book. You're like, I can't even delve into that in order to like to flush this out mm-hmm. for this podcast, because there's just levels of like the past. You shouldn't like open up. Um, it's just something I think when it comes to apologetics specifically, like in relation to the occult, like even Walter Martin joint, like warned about, he said too, like, if you are going to do minister to the occult, like, prepare yourself because mm-hmm. it's it's a different ball game than even like dealing with the cults because you're dealing with something that primarily the, the first and foremost thing is spiritual warfare and so many times like in the new age and the occult you can tell me it's like there's a tendency to like to rely on the flesh and have this like apologetic answer to like rip them apart but it's like you have to be like reliant on the spirit and if any time like you're relying on the flesh you know, like that's probably not a good thing. You need to like really combat that in prayer. Um, but yeah. yeah, like I think that um, you just have to be very, very careful. Like I've had times just when I'm doing research and I'm just like watching somebody online who's like into this stuff. And I, 
I can't listen to more than like five minutes. There's like something there's like just a spirit about this person, you know, of what they're communicating or maybe even what they're in contact with. Like it's like, I can't listen to that anymore. I think you do even in, within Christian apologetics, like you have to be very, very careful about that. Right. And I forgot to mention a big part of the Lord convicting me before that moment was my grandpa sat me down with my cousin and said, what's your relationship with God like? And I remember saying, oh, it's better than ever. I've been reading all these religious texts. And he just said, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the father except through him. And I was so mad. I was shaking. I was never going to talk to him again. I couldn't believe he would be so judgmental. But it didn't matter what I thought because the Lord used his word to penetrate my heart and convict me of sin. And as I was going to the the practice magic and my, it was bothering me. Mm-hmm. So when I when people ask me, how do I witness to people in the occult? Share the gospel. Romans 1.16 talking about the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Mm-hmm. It wasn't someone talking to me about, and, and sometimes I'm sure that's helpful, but ultimately it doesn't save. Ultimately, it's the truth of the gospel that saves and just the importance of, of knowing that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood um, and knowing that we can come to these things with God's word, that it really is sufficient even for talking to people in the occult. You don't have to know everything. And I felt almost weird about not like, oh, I have to read these things. But even as a Christian, there can be that fascination for things in the occult and just being wise because you don't have Mm -hmm. to know everything. And then one last thing speaking, you said we weren't drinking blood. I've said before, when I was in that order, if they had told me to drink blood, it would have totally made sense with what I believed. And because especially in Thelema, Um, that's such a big part of ritual, just the power behind the blood and all that. But even if they were, even if it's worst case scenario in Freemasonry or in any, anything, ultimately remembering we have everything we need in God's word for life and godliness, that we can share the gospel with these people and pray for these people. Cause most of them are people and, and not saying they're like me in that I was a victim because bad things happen to me, but ultimately I continuously chose rebellion. Yeah. Um, but they're hurting people. Josh yeah. and I just spoke to some people in the order and, and it just, it reminds you, these are human beings yeah. made in the image of God that, and that's why you do this podcast. And that's why you do this mm-hmm. podcast because we love you and we don't want you to be deceived by the enemy who hates you. Mm-hmm. We want you to turn to the true God who truly loves you and send his son to die for you that you could be, you could be forgiven of all your sin and made a mm-hmm. new creation. One thing I have, one other question as we wrap up here, and I'll leave it up to you if you have any last thoughts, is what I've noticed with you, which is also common with so many other people I've been across the table with, whether it's in person or via Zoom, is how, as a new ager, their eyes, like before Christ, after Christ. Uh, we did a podcast recently with a gal, uh, Angela Uchi, who, uh, you know, is a fan of our podcast. We've done some collaborations with her. When you look at like her old podcast and you just look at her eyes versus like where she is now, or like Teresa Gentry, these other people. And you've even shared that too. Like that is just so indicative of like the eyes don't lie. Right. <laughs> um, like of what, of what happens of, of that old life versus actually what happens uh, when someone like finds Christ, like, I don't know what, when you remember, like you share, I think you shared that, uh, post a while back, kind of telling that story, you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, maybe just as we wrap up, you're like, just I mean, share everyone like the heart behind, like why you shared that. I think there's a, that's just really sums up our entire conversation. Yeah. There, it's just, it, I really am a new creation in Christ. And it amazes me to this day that people now I live here. I'm next door to you and Mm -hmm. um i at people at my church redeemer bible church when they see me and they see those posts they're like wait that's the same person i would never think that and i remember the first time someone said that to me that meant so much to me because from a child to 20s that was me that Mm -hmm. was everyone knew me as as that yeah and that the lord could 
I never thought I would laugh again. I never thought I would smile again. I was so depraved and broken and empty. The first time I laughed until I cried like was amazing to me. And the fact that people now know me as a joyful person, Mm -hmm. I didn't do work to get joyful. I'm not trying. The Lord is doing a work in me and he's going to bring it to completion. That is amazing. And so I share that because it, that really was my life. And I don't want to forget it because I praise God that he has saved me. I don't want to get so comfortable in in where I am in a wonderful church community that I forget that there are more people that are, that are lost that need to hear the gospel. And so I share that to remember for me. I want to remember because it m- amazes me that I forget that I even was addicted, that I even was completely mm-hmm. wicked and completely deceived. So yeah. that's why. Well, awesome. Well, Jack, thank you for coming on and, and sharing this. I know you've told your story quite a few times, but I know this is going to be a blessing for our audience, maybe even challenging for some. Mm. So uh, thank you for, for just uh, making the time uh, to join us here. And just real quickly, do, do you have like your own YouTube channel or where, where can kind of people find you? I know you're, I've seen a couple of videos of you lately. Where can people find you if they yeah. want to find out more about you? Thank you. Um, you can find me at Jack Marino Chen. That's J-A-C. Mm-hmm. M-A-R-I-N-O yeah. Chen at YouTube or um, just jackmarino.com okay. and I'm making videos on just yeah. sharing what I used to believe and comparing it to the truth. Yeah. And I'll, I'll share it too. Like you had a conversation with one of my former uh, people used to go to church with Chuck Holmes. Yes. So shout out to Chuck Holmes. Yeah. Uh, really awesome. Who knows? Maybe I'll get him on the podcast one day too. That'd be great. Awesome. Well, all right. Well, if you guys enjoyed this episode, let us know what you thought. Uh, leave a comment on our social media. And as always, a program like this cannot continue without your support. So if you feel led to support us, go to thecultishow.com. You can go to the donate tab. You can donate one time or monthly. All that being said, we'll talk to you all next time on Cultish, where we enter into the kingdom of the cults. Talk to you guys soon.